Special thanks to uh, last week, Rick Babel. Where are you, Rick? There you are. Thank you for bringing the word, brother. That was good. Appreciate what you gave to us as a congregation. Lenny, nice job, buddy. Nice job. He gave a testimony last week, so thank you for doing that. And i um, grateful for our men's retreat yesterday. There was, I think it was 101 of us were there. Well, I was supposed to say that. That's not true, actually. But that was a running joke because the ladies had like 100 people. So I was like, all right, guys, let's join together. We're going to tell them there was 101. There was not that many. However, the Lord was with us and spoke to our hearts and we connected with him and each other. So that was a beautiful and wonderful thing. And uh, last, last weekend, my wife and I, um, uh, Michael and Naomi, another couple, went up to a marriage retreat called Weekend to Remember, which I'm going to say that'll be a good thing for most of us to go to if you're married in the future. You'll hear more about that, but it was a good thing for us personally. It's good for you that we have a good marriage as well. You can say amen to that, right? And so, yeah, it was good to spend some time there uh, together with those folks in that context, learning about and growing in marriage. So it's a good thing. All right, so, of course, we are jumping back into the book of Habakkuk. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. I'm going to set us up a little bit this way. So my goal this morning is to persuade you to continue to live by faith in the midst of difficulty, injustice, sorrow, suffering, darkness, to persuade you to continue to trust the promises of God that He will indeed fulfill His Word, that He indeed hears your prayer, He indeed is for you, not against you, and that there will be salvation in the future. And God also will deal, just not now sometimes, but for sure in the future, with all of those who rebel and rally and go against Him, His character, and His Word. So in the book of Habakkuk, our friend, the prophet Habakkuk, who speaks to God for people, speaks for God to people, has complained to God right in the opening passage, saying, how long, O Lord, how much are you going to allow injustice and sorrow and suffering and violence and all of these things? God, do you hear me? Because I'm speaking, I'm not hearing anything. God, do you see? Do you know? Do you understand? And he voices this concern. Well, in the book, we see that God replies to this complaint by telling Habakkuk, hey, look up, look to me, and look around. I am working in the nations. Habakkuk, I've heard your prayer, even though you haven't necessarily seen my answer. I have been working, and it is bigger, and it is broader than you can understand. I'm going to use a nation. I'm going to deal with the injustice and the wickedness of this nation and in this situation. God said that he will use a ruthless nation to discipline a rebellious one. It's important for us to think about. That's Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11. Now, in hearing this news, Habakkuk replies by rehearsing what he knows about God. If you remember this, in a few short verses, he talks about 10 things he knows about God. His justice his promises, his holiness, his righteousness, and says, God, you're going to use this nation, but I'm trusting your promise that we will not perish. And then he asked God some question. Okay, God, well, wait a second. You're bringing in these people, and they're horrible. They're terrible. They're idol worshipers. They're ruthless. They're violent, and they hook people like with fishing hooks and God are you going to let them off the hook what about them God in chapter 2 God replies to Habakkuk listen up Habakkuk hey write this down understand 
the certainty of accountability to all humanity. Okay, hear that. The certainty of accountability for all humanity. God said to Habakkuk, when I'm going to reveal to you, it will happen. It speaks of the end. And it will not prove false. But you must wait. I don't like waiting, by the way. <laughs> My guess is you do not either. But in the plan of God, he makes room for and even ordains waiting. And recognition in the waiting, this is where we grow. And the waiting is where we mature. And the waiting is where our faith is proved genuine. It's one thing, and it's easy to praise God when everything is turning out well and all your roses come up and all things are turning out just as you desire. It's easy at that point to praise God. But the question is, when you are suffering, and I'm not necessarily just talking about a momentary sliver in your finger. I'm talking about also long-term situations, long-term health situations, long-term prodigals, long-term difficulty. Do you, will you believe and continue to believe in those times? And so this conversation continues going back and forth. They say, hey, Habakkuk, you are going to wait. But what I'm telling you is going to happen. And I will deal with this puffed up, low down, unrighteous, arrogant, ruthless, greedy Babylon. This nation who's coming in. And also all of the Babylons of the world. If you want to do an interesting study, by the way, you probably haven't done this. Type into a concordance the word Babylon, right? And recognize that it is a city, a people at a time and a place. But it also is a metaphor of all people who act in accordance with the spirit of Babylon. You'll read it throughout scripture. You'll see it in the book of Revelation. If you read it, it's like, what does this, what is this all about? God is addressing and fulfilling his promise here that those who are arrogant and ruthless and greedy and abusers of power and on and on that there will be judgment. This is why in Romans chapter 12 the Lord says, hey, do not repay evil with evil. But you overcome evil with, what's the word? Good. Because if we repay evil for evil, all we get is more evil. <laughs> well, they deserve it. Hmm. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And in that passage, it says, leave room for the, here's the word that we don't like, wrath of God. You return evil with good and trust that as I am calling people to myself, the kindness of God leads people to what? Repentance, right? Giving them opportunity to come to him through your kindness, or better yet, the Lord's kindness through you. You understand that? And if people refuse him and refuse salvation and refuse to understand the goodness of God, then they'll receive the justice of God. And it is one sense heartbreaking, and in another sense it is comforting knowing that God will deal with injustice. Because as you know, this world is not just, and we can say amen to that. Right? Our hearts long for a world that is right, and as we look around, and sometimes as we experience difficulties, and heartaches, and heartbreaks in our life, we know inside of our soul that this is not the way it was meant to be. And so we long for righteousness and justice and goodness. And God says, this will happen, but trust me, I am working out my plan. So the question for us is, will we continue to trust him? The righteous will stand by their faith, by the faith of the faithful. 
faithful one as we believe in him. Habakkuk understands this, and it was presented last week about the importance of this. And then in our passage today, starting in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 6, now the Lord starts to say, hey, I'm going to tell you what's up, right? And he gives five different woes. If you're going to hear a woe, you're not going to like it. Woe to you. Woe is me. He's pronouncing judgment on Five different things. Now, these five things might immediately not come to uh, attention to you, right? You'll say, well, what is it? Well, these five things actually are, are, are based upon the Ten Commandments. There are extrapolations from these things and saying people who do these things have broken, trespassed God's very law. And in the midst of this mighty force that looks uh, in Unstoppable and, and super powerful. God declares in this passage that He is the Almighty God, that He is the King of heavenly armies, that He is on His holy throne. The nations are to be silent before Him. And so we're going to look at this, and this is a difficult thing to consider understand who God is. Okay. We're going to see this as two weeks from now we get an image of God that is frightening, powerful, overwhelming. We'll see the same type of images in the book of Revelation where God is indeed a God of grace and mercy. We can say amen to that. But God is not a weak God. He doesn't lack for power. He is supreme over all things, and He calls us to Himself to be in relationship with Him. He calls us to Himself so that we can be like Him and that we can obey Him. Right relationship with God and putting ourselves in right relationship with each other. Love the Lord your God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. So he delineates for us. He tells us about these things. And this is the first woe. And there's going to be five of them. He says, woe to those who abuse their position to gain wealth. Does that ever happen in our world? I'm glad you're laughing. Right? Habakkuk 2, starting with verse 6. This is the intro to this whole um, woe section. The Lord says, Will not all of them taunt him okay, with ridicule and scorn, saying, Okay, what, what is this? Okay, Will not all of them. Who's all of them? All of them are those in verse you can just look up a little bit, verse 5. This is all of the nations and all of the people who have been captive or abused by all of the quote-unquote Babylons of the world. People who take advantage of other people. So those who have been abused, who have been pushed down, who have been neglected, who have been forgotten, who have been taken advantage of, those people, right, well, not all of them, witness. And the word here is taunt with ridicule, right? There's this sense of forlorning and witnessing. Will not all of them taunt him who is Babylon, those who have abused their position, who have done these things, will they not say, woe to him or to her? who piles up stolen goods and makes themselves wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will not they wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's Blood, you have destroyed lands and cities. 
and everyone in them. Let's pause right there. Now, in my mind, the people who immediately come to my thoughts are those who prey on others because of their desperate situations. Right? These are the payday loan places in town, right? Who charge 23%, 25%, 35%. And someone who is very desperate to try to pay their bills often, and they take advantage by extortion. Okay, I'll give you money now, but mm, it's going to cost you, right? These are credit card companies, right, who just pile up interest rates, right? 19% is the average, by the way, interest rate. Please pay off your credit card, by the way, okay? It's places and people, and these are not just companies. There's people who run the companies, folks, who are taking advantage of others by ex charging exorbitant interest, by predatory lenders, by the way, for cars and loans and houses, right? People who keep the poor poor because it's good business for them to do so. Right? Abuse their position. Right? These are the slave labor places that pay their quote-unquote employees next to nothing as they continue to get rich. About 10 years ago, I had a friend who attended our church that he was in debt. And so, quote-unquote, his landlord gave him, quote-unquote, free rent and paid him $50 a week. He was married. He had two children. But this is all that he could afford, and he worked this guy like a slave, day in, day out. And this young man felt like he had to do this because he had no other opportunity. That is wrong. And it happens not just over there, but it also happens in places like here. This is problematic. These also are the insurance companies who charge high rates <laughs> but fight to pay as little as they can. Anybody in here know anything about that? The list goes on and on and on. Will this go on forever? The good news is it will not. People will get away with wickedness for a time, but they will not get away with wickedness for all time. God does see, hear, acts, and he defends those who have a hard time or cannot defend themselves. Woe to you who abuse their position to gain wealth. Second, God addresses this through the prophet Habakkuk. Woe to those who use their wealth for self-preservation <laughs> and self-glorification. By the way, in all of these things, don't be thinking of those people, by the way. Oh, well, I know who this message is for. All right, I'm going to send it to them. I'm asking you, as you are holding on to faith, to examine yourself. Is there a way in which I do this? Is there something here that applies to me as well? And the list gets pretty deep, by the way. So this second category are those who use wealth for self-preservation and self-glorification. Habakkuk chapter 2, starting with verse 9. Woe to him or her who builds their realm, right? Their kingdom. <laughs> How? By unjust gain. To what? To set his nest on high above all the riffraff. To escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house, and you forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the word work would, will echo it. Often, by the way, these are the well-connected, the ultra-wealthy people who see themselves as untouchable, right? Are there people in the world that are like this? Yeah, right? They can buy the best lawyers, they can be, go to their own private airports, they can 
have their own villa plus villa plus villa plus villa, private rooms, private entrances, private lives. Now, is there a problem with having wealth? The answer to that is no, right? But these type of people have gathered wealth at the expense of hundreds and thousands so that they can spend it on themselves, right? These are people, and I kid you not, that will have contingency plans for everything, including there's a bunker in this basement, there's a bunker in that basement, including there's an escape pod if there ever was a um, national or, uh, yeah, national disaster or even trying to get out into the atmosphere to float around until they can land safely and that they can be preserved while the rest of humanity, mm, sorry about your luck. These are folks who do that in our world, build their kingdom, build their realm, feel like they are untouchable and trying to save themselves, they lose themselves. But if you really want to save yourself, lose yourself for Christ and his kingdom. Give yourself for things that really matter. Those who try to hold on to their life here, it's all you get is your life here. You actually are losing your life. Our society tells us that this is what we should aim for, right? Mo money, honey, right? Right? Come on. The quote unquote American dream. Is the American dream God's dream? I'm asking you that question. So, what is God's dream? How does He define success? And let us aim for that. But in our society, there's those who are up here and up there and up there. They gather things for self-preservation, self-glorification. And God says, woe to you. The third woe that we see in this passage is this. Woe to the corrupt political powers. Do we have problems with that here? Oh, it's the other party. The one that you didn't vote for. Dave, you're stepping on our toes. Your toes need to be stepped on as I'm tying my toes. I'm stepping on my own. Right? Habakkuk 2, 12. Third woe, woe to him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> woe to him. Who builds a city. Excuse me. <coughs> Builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor, those that you have enlisted and enslaved, is only fuel for the fire? <clears throat> that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. These are the political powers and the dictators who abuse their positions and powers for the glory of the motherland, for their place in history and for personal gain. You don't have to know a lot about history to understand these type of folks have risen up over all time to crush people, to grab land, to build kingdoms, and to destroy everyone else in the name of their country, Hitler. (laughs) Good timing, right? (laughs) God will blow you out of his nose. How do you like that? Okay. That was disgusting. Okay. Where did that come from? I don't know. (laughs) These are people in our day, right? From Nebuchadnezzar all the way to uh, Vladimir Putin and King John Un. Corruptions and positions of power is a major problem in the world. And millions upon millions have died and currently suffer this way. 
We sang a song this morning about Mission's Flame. Like, why are we singing about this song, right? We're singing about God send us out. We're singing about God's care for the nations. God cares for every nation in the world. Not just this one. God, help us to see what God sees. He cares for America just as much as He cares for China. Or Indonesia, or Venezuela, or Russia, or Ukraine, or Myanmar. Pick your place on this planet. God cares. I've been in many places, and a lot of times there is corruption, there is atrocities that happen because of these leaders building their own kingdom. And when aid comes in, they take about mm, 80% and the rest go here. Have you ever heard of Haiti? Have you been there? This is a problem. And the people suffer. People suffer in our country as well. How many of our governors in Illinois are currently in jail right now? It's a pathway to prison, right? It's a problem. (laughs) It is their fault. We are bent towards abusing power. God help us to have a different spirit by His mercy to be different. To use our power and position to help, to bring about God's kingdom, not our little kingdom. And recognition that He is the one who's on the throne. And recognition that these dictators want their voice to be heard throughout the earth. But in reality, God's voice is going to hear, be heard in all the earth. They want their glory to fill the earth. And guess what? God's glory is going to fill the earth. We have to recognize that we're all under the supreme authority. Even though, again, for a time, there is wickedness. There is injustice. There is violence. It's for a time, but it's not for all time. And those who think they are untouchable are reached by God. There's another category, right? Woe to the corrupt political powers, right? Who are trying to build their kingdom where God's kingdom will reign. And second, here's, here's excuse me, uh, fourthly, here's another category. Woe to those who intoxicate and intimidate. Right? This is getting perhaps very close to home. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. God continues to proclaim this. Woe to him, to her, who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskins, in our case the wine bottles, till these neighbors are drunk. Why? So that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame. Instead of glory, now it's your turn. You gave drink to others, now it's your turn to drink. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you. And disgrace will cover your glory. The violence that you've done to Lebanon, other places, will overwhelm you. And your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood... You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. This is drinking with evil intent. And it happens in bar rooms and ballrooms and boardrooms and in bedrooms. People with substances is sneaking it in. People intending to intoxicate others to take advantage of them. Does that happen? Pick your place. Drunkenness with evil intent. Using substances 
to get people in a position that they can take advantage of them. This happens all the time. Right? And afterwards, there's this gloating over the glory. Let me tell you what happened last night. Here's a couple photos to prove it. And often it's the guys who are talking about these things, how they were able to increase their quote-unquote body count. By intoxicating other people. Guys, this is a problem and it happens all the time. <laughs> Will these people get away with this forever? It's to their shame, not to their glory. This passage says the Lord will expose those who expose others. And this happens on both a macro level small level, excuse me, that's a large level, a micro level or a macro level. Right? We see headlines by individuals who fly to private islands to abuse often young girls. This is a problem. And you think, God, what are you going to do about this? Yeah, he knows People who intoxicate others to take advantage of them. And then it's intimidation, right? Violence. In this case, they mentioned animals right here, right? And granted, that could be in that context, in that culture, this is their means to, if you had a, um, a horse, it was a means of transportation. A donkey was a means of providing for your family, okay? This is not just, you know, pets. But there are people who abuse one thing to intimidate other things. By the way. I had a stepdad like this, by the way, who would kill animals viciously and cruelly to intimidate everyone else in the household. Some of you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Or beat something up or smash a door or punch a wall out. Well, I'm just expressing my rage. Mm. Yeah, and you're intimidating everybody who's around you. Violence, crushing people, destroying things. Both of these are trying to control other people for their selfish means. I sometimes wonder what happens in our city. Let's not talk about, you know, wherever. Istanbul, let's talk about Rockford. Right? What happens? What goes on? Sometimes I get pictures of things, images of going into homes. And when I worked construction for a while, I got to walk in lots of things. My job at one point was to take pictures of houses that have been um, used or neglected or people didn't pay their bills. My job was to go in, break into a window, okay, go in the house and photograph what's going on and so it can be reported to the police or to the landlord. Unbelievable what I had to take photos of. That are happening on the outside, the house looks really good, you open the inside, and it is a cesspool. In some cases, literal cesspool. In one case, walking into a house, flies all over the place, walking through stuff this high, they dump out this, this bucket that had dead mice in it. <laughs> this is telling you the truth. I literally like puked. It was so rancid. And on the same mattress where a dog had been using as its potty place, it's where the kids slept. No, I'm not, I'm just, okay. It's just reality. What about that? What about these places? What about those who have been abused in these ways. God, what about that? 
Woe to you. Granted, we offer mercy, and we'll see that next week, God, in your wrath, remember mercy, but we have to know that there is a righteous and holy God that deals with these things. Hard, it's heavy, it's true. You'll see this in the book of Revelation. Read Revelation 18. I put a lot of different scriptures in here you can go and look at. So you'll know I'm not just telling you stuff. It's there. Lastly, it goes to this. Of the woes. Woe to those who trust in other gods. This is what is said here in verse, verses 18 and 19. Of what value is an idol? Since a man, since a person made it, carved it. Or an image that teaches lies. For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? Is it covered? It is covered with gold and silver. No breath in it. Now, the first form of idolatry here is less likely in our country than in other places of the word, world. This is a form of a physical idol that is worshipped. I've been to India a couple times. By the way, Pastor Key, right now, the senior pastor of our Myanmar congregation, is in India right now. He's speaking every day to a group of refugees from Myanmar who are in India. He is there experiencing these things. I remember being in various parts of India, and I kid you not, on almost every corner of every major city was an idol, right? Often in cages, right, because people would do whatever, and there was incense burning, and there was flowers offered. All over. 1.3 billion people in this country, from tall statues that you could see for miles to ones that you would come across almost every block. We think, oh, what are they doing? (laughs) This is an issue in this world, worshiping things versus worshiping the Creator. People do this. Now, in our country, there is some of this but not of ton. But what we have more so is this second category. We read, for what value is an idol since a man has carved it? Or an image that teaches lies. So what's this, right? These are images that are both still and images that are both moving. This is what you need to look like, right? It's teaching lies. This is how you are to act in in movies, and this is how you are to interact with violence or sexual perversion or lying, and we love it. All things are educational, by the way. Entertainment, quote-unquote, is also educational. The question is not, is it educating? The question is, what is being taught? From little children to grown adults, we look to, I want to be like this person who looks a certain way. And so we try to make that happen. Or I want to be like these people who have all of these nice things, and we strive for that. And we are believing lies. That success equals beauty. Success equals money. Success equals the good life. Is that how God defines success? And by the way, preachers will sell you this false gospel every single day. Just turn on your television. Show me chapter and verse. And so we turn to these false idols. We turn to these images that teach us lies. And we tend to turn to only 
these lesser gods, right? Gods of our own making. And the truth is, we become like what we worship. Do you hear me? It's powerful, it's glorious, but we become like what we worship. So the question is not, are you worshiping something, but what are you worshiping? This is important. All of the gods of this world, those who have power, position, or pedigree, all of them are accountable to the Holy Lord in His temple. Now let's look at this last verse of all of this. I said this is heavy, and it is heavy. Okay. God is dealing with these things. Every Babylon that every ever existed God will deal with them. And this last verse is stunning. As we look through this valley of despair, we look up, up, up. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before Him. Get that in your mind. All of the people and all the politicians and all the power brokers who puff themselves up, who climb up ladders and build high places and build fortresses and build all of these places, you will never reach the level of God Almighty. He is in His holy temple. Be quiet. This is the God of the Bible. The one, yes, who offers mercy for our sin from His wrath. God saves us for Himself from Himself. Think about that a little bit. God's wrath on sin. Well, I'm glad I'm not like those people. (laughs) Ten Commandments. This guy. Zero for ten. Broke them all. God, I need your salvation. I need your mercy. God is just. And we should be thankful about that. God gives people opportunity to show who they are. That's why there is a waiting. That is why there is prayers. That's why there is mercy. That's why there is grace. But people refuse it. Then they face a holy God. You and I will face this same why we cling to Jesus the Christ, the shield of salvation, who took the wrath on God on himself so that we may be forgiven. We say amen. But you don't understand the glories of salvation unless you understand the horrors of sin. These things are horrific. God has the first word. God has the last word. God's word is eternal. His word has authority. His word is final. This is our great God, the balancer of the scales, the one who sees all in truth, who will act in power and justice and truth, the one whom all will answer, He is holy. And we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, so that each one may receive what is due for 
what he or she has done in the body. <laughs> Whether good or evil. Our salvation is based on the mercy that comes through Jesus Christ. Who saves us from the wrath of God on sin. We must, you must be in Christ. That's the only safe harbor for the storm. In your wrath, God, remember mercy. God is just. Our salvation is based upon God's mercy. Our reward is based upon, hmm, this is interesting. What is done in the body, what you do matters. It matters. It matters. It matters. Why? Because of God's character. Why? Because of God's love. God's justice is an extension of God's love. Do you understand this? So let us observe the God who is holy that all nations should be silent. Let us worship the God who is the general of heaven's armies. Let's trust in Him as we trust in Christ as we continue to do good, to alleviate injustice in the world to be agents of truth, of healing, of hope, of peace, of goodness. Pleading with people to be in Christ. Knowing that God will deal with all injustice justly. This is important for us to understand. Christopher Johnson, why don't you come on up here? Where are you? I know it's a lot. I know it's heavy. And hopefully you hear my heart. I do it with sadness, but also in comfort, knowing that God will deal with things. So Christopher, I've asked him to share part of his story. Good to see you, Christopher. All right. Go for it, man. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. I took your advice and I wrote it down. <laughs> um, I just titled what I'm about to say, Hope and Final Judgment. Uh, when Pastor Dave asked me to share my testimony based on Habakkuk, uh, I decided to tie it into some things that were good and powerful, uh, but then I read the early release of his sermon uh, that he sent me. And all the things that welled up in me based upon my life and the things I must endure day to day from those who are more wicked than I, and yet like the Israelites of uh, Habakkuk's day, they have been given temporary authority over me in my life due to my past sins. You see, when you are on the outside of the criminal justice system, you have no knowledge nor desire to know um, what actually goes on. However, for those of us like myself, who have experienced and know the workings of the system, it is a different story. Every day I live in the flashpoint, the small space that exists between gasoline and fire. I fight to utilize the negative things as fuel to keep going, but some days I just want to burn it all down. Often I am brought to the point of rage because of the blatant abuse, of, blatant abuse and injustice. Often I am brought to actual tears because of the overbearing yoke that I must endure. I want to leave, yet they tell me I cannot go. But when I stay, they tell me they don't want me here. How long, O oh Lord, how long? How long will they rule over me? How long must I endure their mocking? How long must I undergo their watchful eye over me? How long must I kiss the hand that smites me? How long, O oh Lord, how long? Have not my sins been forgiven? Has not my debt to society been paid? Why then has my punishment been extended beyond the price required of me? 
How long, O Lord, how long? Yet my hope is in the final judgment of the righteous one. He who separates the wicked from the righteous. I know that persecution is my privilege. I know that victory is my portion. I know that God, my redeemer, has a plan drafted from eternity's beginning. I know that I will dwell with him until eternity's end. I know that my purpose is not yet fulfilled. I know that my race is not yet finished. I know that trials come to make me more like you, Lord. I know that praise and worship is perfected in the furnace. Therefore, Lord, remember your promises to your servant and deliver me for your name's sake. As I rehearse your unchanging character and reflect on your mighty works of old, I will strengthen myself in who you are. I will stand my watch. I will not die. Christopher truly came to Christ uh, while he was incarcerated. And he was there, yes, he felt um, that weight and paid that price. And these things continue. So it's hard, you know, living with a title, right? Felon or... Um, what have you. <laughs> but yet God changes hearts and lives. Right? In the midst of being seen through a lens that you are no longer, it's a burden. Right? But in God's goodness, He does redeem as He deals with situations and individuals. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing uh, one of my favorite recent songs, and then we'll be released. So let's pray. <clears throat> God, it's hard for us. Especially at times when it seems like those who have privilege or position or possession... get away with so much. It's maddening to know that bars right down this street, people are taking advantage of other people. God, it's difficult to know that behind some doors, in our neighborhoods, there's intimidation and violence. God, we know that you are a righteous God. You are a holy God. You are a saving God. But how long, oh Lord, can this stuff happen? How long will you, God, see and hear and deliver and send help. Asking you in the land of the living, God, we know eternally this will happen. God, for those who do not have a voice, we speak. Those without power, God, we're asking, God, will you use us? Show your We're grateful, God, that you see all things truly. You know exactly what's going on. And God, will you help us to examine ourselves? Do I fall in these categories of woe? And then, God, help us to say, woe is me, and repent while there's still time. And may your righteousness and your glory fill the whole earth and we long for it. We thank you for what we have in Christ. We thank you for your goodness. We praise you for your holiness and your righteousness. 
May you be honored in all places. And we can't wait till our King is here again on the earth reigning forever and ever and ever. May your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.